Hello everyone, the day is Thursday, October 10, 2019, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as often summing up, all predictions about the future. Man, a lot of stuff can happen to me now and then. So what do we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I think that's the elephant in the room. Your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep them just for my ADD purposes relative to the slide so I don't get too far sidetracked. I tend to go off on tangents, if you know me. And we, you could ask about anything you want when we get towards the end of the show. And also your favorite stock picks. Hold off on those, and that's for your benefit to make sure that they don't get buried in the other questions. And also ask about one pick at a time and hit enter. You can ask about as many as you want, but just let's start with one pick at a time. That way I'll know which ones. I have covered in which ones I have. This week's focus is how I played the recent slide. I woke up this morning thinking, all right, what's kind of, uh, what's neat to know in EAT, what you need to know. And I really was thinking, boy, I really need to get back into that trading psychology because I haven't talked about that in a day. And then it's like, you know, right now would be a good time because I think most people want to know what you're doing and how you're doing and give it these kind of crazy market conditions. Now, last week we looked at the Landry list at the high. And what did we have? We had some software stocks as potential shorts. We had some a retail, I think, as a potential short. We had one retail as a potential long, but that was the only long setup other than a couple of golds. And I think that was the database speaking. And we talked a lot about that last week. So following up on that, I thought it'd be a good idea to talk about what I played and how I played it. And then the other thing is, plus, is Winter Watch still in effect? And I'm not sure what that little greater sign means. So is winter still coming, as I've been saying on and off. Every time the market gets a little iffy, that bastard Jon Snow complains that winter is coming. And then I think winter eventually came. So I guess the big question is, are we back in the woods? Well, one thing that I find kind of interesting is if you want to look at things from a longer term basis, this is a weekly chart, and you go all the way back the last couple of years, I guess four years, and you can see we have daylight above, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. This is the 50-week moving average. Now we use this 50-week moving average in the TFM 10% system. And as long as you close above the 50-week moving average and you're within 10% of the 50-week closing high, you want to stay long. If you close below the average and you're still within 10% of the 50-week closing high, you want to make sure you become a little cautious and get ready to get ready on the short side. Now, I've beat the dead horse in the system, so there's no need to go through it again today. But if you go in and watch last week's presentation, which you can get a link from today's market in a minute. No, I'm sorry, yesterday's market in a minute. Or just look on my website for that, www.davelander.com. I walk through the entire system. So it's kind of interesting that to maintain longer-term perspective, we're still under a longer-term buy signal, or we're still long, I should say, under a longer-term buy. Now, if we drop below that 50-week moving average like we did a while back and we're more than 10% away from the 50-week closing high, and that's the whole system, so more than 10% in this case of this closing high here, then you would exit the market and possibly go short. I haven't tested it on the short side, but I think it shows a little bit of promise. Might have a little lag on getting out of the market, though. That's the only concern there. Now, last week we talked a little bit about the second mouse signal. And the second mouse means the early bird might get the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. So we had a bow tie back in August when things were looking a little iffy, and it triggered. And the market sold off a little bit, but it didn't come unglued. But what's interesting is we never got past that prior high, and then we had a secondary bow tie, or a second bow tie, which officially, as of yesterday, 
is a complete signal. We had the bow tie a few days ago, but until and unless you have a higher high and higher low, which we had yesterday, the signal is not complete. So the short would be below yesterday's low on that. And sometimes the second signal is the real signal. And second signals can be a little bit more robust as I think I said last week, the late and the great Kevin Haggerty, when he would have new traders come into his organization, they, until they proved their worth at least, were not allowed to take first signals. And now he's he was doing a bunch of intraday stuff, but it all applies. Markets are markets and patterns are patterns, as I'll show you in just one second. But the new guys couldn't take the first signal. They had to sit there and wait for the second signal. And I think that speaks on a variety of levels one it develops discipline being willing to forego that first signal two it obviously along the lines of discipline creates patience and then three the chances of their success because they need to get a few wins under their belt are much 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 greater by taking those second signals now as you mature as a trader, you're not going to have the luxury of sitting around for a second signal. But if you're a little bit newer to trading, maybe some sort of second signal strategy might be pretty good for you until you get the reps in, until you get quite a few trades under your belt and get some success happening. Now, I thought it would be interesting to, as I said in the previews or in the introduction to this, go over what happened in the portfolio going back several weeks and how we played it going all the way back to late September. So if you're on the trading service, if you go down below the video of the day, you could see the recent services that keep four or five months of services down here. And if you're not on the service, and I'll put some links on the website, maybe in the free area, you can go to this big old long URL right here, and I'll have to shorten that to DaveLeonard.com slash archives. But if you go to that one, first chance I get, I'm going to delete that one and put a redirect to archives. You can walk through these trading services, and it's a good exercise, especially if you can't sleep at night. But all kidding aside, and I'll, I'll put August and September in there first chance. We still have one possible active signal, and that's why I haven't updated those just yet. But if you walk through these, you get a really good feel for how I saw the market. And you could see that it's not in perfect hindsight. Now, I do occasionally cherry pick a nice looking setup because it makes such a good teaching example. But you get to look at the archives, warts and all. And I think that's a great free education, if I say so myself. And you may agree or agree to disagree with my analysis, but at least you could see what I saw when I saw it, given the information at hand. Obviously, again, hindsight's 2020, but looking through these going back in time, you know what information I had and you know what I saw or maybe what I didn't see or what I should have seen. Now, this is what the current portfolio looks like, and it's I think it's interesting how it all shook out in spite of these lackluster conditions. We actually have, knock on wood, a profitable portfolio. And a couple days ago, I think it was 100% profitable, meaning that everything was in the black. But not some of them, but not by much. Now, we shorted TSCO, which is a retail stock. And I'm going to walk you through each one of these trades one by one. We shorted PAGS, which is a software stock. We went long gold, and we went long an IPO. Now, Gold can trade contra to the overall market or in lieu of the overall market or ignore what the overall market is doing. And I like the setup there, and I'll show you why in just one second. And so far, our gold stocks haven't paid off. Well, it happens, you know. But I still think they have promise, and I have a stop in place just in case. Now, we did go long one stock in spite of the overall market conditions. And that was because it was a more speculative issue and an IPO and also Chinese. So sometimes these super speculative issues 
can move independently of the overall market. And I thought it was worth going after. And so far, today notwithstanding, one F-bomb aside <laughs> so far, it's worked out pretty nicely. So let's pick apart these setups. First of all, we had AUI, which was a TKO. By the way, I'm getting some questions on TKOs, as I often do. People look at a, a small little bar down, and that might be my fault because I think in my first book I said at least a two bar low, but I didn't really quantify it by saying or qualify. It depends on how you want to look at it since I'm a discretionary guy. But I didn't qualify it by saying that it really, really has to be a wide range bar down because you have a lot of little two bar moves. But in addition to two bars, it needs to be a wide range bar down. It should stick out like a sore thumb. So if you're looking at this trend from the June lows in here, or the May lows, I guess, in this case, you could see you really don't have that many wide range bars. And all of a sudden, bam, you got this huge wide range bar down. So that's why I liked it as a TKO. So here's the portfolio. One thing I find kind of interesting in looking at this this morning is that the portfolio was empty except for the placeholders for all the formulas that I have in here and by the way I think I have this spreadsheet if you go into members resources under the members area I do have this spreadsheet available to download if you want to plug your own trades in or follow along at home with the stuff that I'm doing so here was the setup AUI buy number of shares per hundred thousand dollars it's a sizable position but it's a cheap stock and it's also not a tremendous amount of risk percentage wise yeah it's a big risk but point wise only 0 0.70 and or 70 cents so the entry was 350 objective stop was 280 and initial profit was 420 well if this thing doesn't rally soon we might need some 420 all right, so there's your buy at 350. Your stop was here. Your initial profit target is off the charts so far on this one, literally. So, so far, it really hasn't done anything. But Dave, why would you get out? Isn't that dead money? No, no, no. Go in and watch all of the dead money reports that I've done for the last 20 something years that I've been doing this. If you're stopped out, then you're wrong and you get out. If you're not, you just sit tight. Now, not that I would make an exception from one stock or the other, but as I'm going live this morning, or in this morning's case, trying to get live with this go to webinar glitch, I was thinking that I feel, I wouldn't say I feel great because you never feel great, but I feel pretty good about honoring my plan, meaning sitting with a stock that seems like dead money in this particular case because it's a gold stock and all we need is 140 characters to come out <laughs> and we could have some really nice profits in this and also given the world situation with geopolitical wars or geopolitical politics I should say and everything that's shaken out right now, I'm not too concerned about being long a gold stock. I think the worst thing could happen is I get stopped out and I'll just drop an F-bomb and move on. So we'll see. As you know, I like to use as many live examples as possible. Today I'm showing you everything. And hopefully, and I know you said use the word hope, but hopefully six months from now I can say, hey guys, remember back in October, when I was showing you the portfolio and look, we're still long these gold stocks and we're still short these other stocks. Isn't that cool? Now, the other one was tractor supply. Tractor supply had a nice little thrust down followed by a pullback. So I call it a first, it's kind of a first thrust. It's kind of also a pullback. I suppose your, your original first thrust was up here. And but you had a lot of support over here. That's probably why I ignored that initial first thrust. But then once it got past that support and began to pull back a little bit, I thought it was worth a shot. So here's the setup, and then in the portfolio, the way it unfold is kind of cool because here's your AUI. Remember, we had no setups. Now we have this AUI. Look at that, it's actually profitable by a little bit. Better than a poke in the eye, right? 
And then here are the next setups. TSEO, we're gonna sell short. This negative or red here means that we're selling it short. In the portfolio, one means long. So one AUI, we're long. Minus one means short. So we don't have any shorts in the portfolio just yet. We're risking 2% per trade. And then I don't know if you could see it, but above this somewhere, no, you can't see it, it got cut off says the model portfolio size well we use 100k just to keep the math really really easy and then you could parlay that amount or decrease that amount depending upon your account size and i usually keep this spreadsheet open in one of my monitors just so i can look over and say okay well i want to do so many shares in this account and so many shares in that account roughly to get to that two percent risk in all of the accounts or maybe risk a little bit more in one account and a little bit less in another just to get to that 2% level, whatever it takes. So we're going to risk 2% per trade, and that means that on that hypothetical $100,000, every trade we go in, we're risking $2,000, and that's plenty enough risk. And I've doodled with 5%, and boy, you can get into a hell of a lot of trouble fast at 5%. You four or five losing trades in a row, you're now at a 25 30% drawdown, okay, or four to six losing trades in a row, which believe me, it happens and it gets ugly really fast. So 2% seems to be just big enough to do really well when the market trends in your favor, but also not too big to where it can kill you. You could be wrong quite a lot, obviously 10 trades in a row and hopefully, I just said hope, not that that will ever happen, but it will. On, say at one point in your career, you'll really hit a rough spot but that's 20% drawdown. And that anything below, anything above 20% of the drawdown is very concerning because it begins to, to grow geometrically from there, as you likely know. So anyway, let's get back to this. So we're going to sell short at this level here. Now, notice what it immediately did. It immediately went against us fairly hard over the next several days. And that makes you question your sanity. Well, let me tell you a little secret about the short side. It seems like all sharks go against you. In fact, that's a Wall Street adage. But you have to go after them. And I think one of the things I was gonna to say today, and I've beat the dead horse on it so many times, is that you should short the market, not because you're gonna get rich shorting the market, but more so because it helps you to see both sides of the market. And obviously when things get a little iffy like now, you can pick up a little money here and there, although you come in a day like yesterday and every now and then you get these big rallies and you begin to question your sanity. But if you're using good money management, you can pick up a little money along the way. And not that I wanna be shot in Friday, but when the market starts coming unglued, it's nice to be able to keep your head while everyone else is losing theirs. And usually I could tell when the market's getting in trouble because the man on the street, who, who knows me, by the way, is like, Dave, are you doing okay in these markets? And I'm like, I'm actually doing pretty good. And like, but I don't want to tell them. I just kind of tell them, yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm not bad. You know, I've got money management. And stuff. I don't want to say like, hey, you know what? I'm shorting the hell of this thing. Anyway, so our stop was way up here. Well, that's what it called for. And if you look for several days, it looked like it was going to go up and hit that stop for a pretty quick loss. But fortunately, it did sell off nicely. It hit the initial profit target. And in this particular case, we are at break even on the trailing stop because it really didn't drop much further than that initial profit target. Now, remember when you're trailing a stop you're loosening that stop up as you go you want to get to break even as soon as possible meaning as soon as it hits that initial profit target but then once you're there you can sit back and relax play with the market's money is what i say charlie kirk called it free rolling he called it my free rolling strategy i kind of like that i might borrow that term from him and then you try to sit back and relax, I know, ha ha, and let things unfold. But by loosening that stop, a lot of times you're able to ride out that longer term trend. Now, one more point, getting back to the long side, it, it makes a little bit more sense to understand. But let's say you're risking 2% on the long side, 
and you get that 1% overall profit. So you're, you take that profit, you move your stop to break even, and let's say that stock continues to run in your favor. Well, that stock is increasing in value. So now on an overall portfolio basis, it becomes a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger part of your portfolio, which is a good thing, but even at that initial 2% risk, that stock can become a sizable port part of your portfolio, and that's why 2% risk is plenty. For instance, let's say like this particular stock here, we had a bow tie, and then this was our entry. So we're looking at 2,000 shares. So let's say we flip out 1,000. Well, we got 1,000 shares at, let's say, six bucks after we hit that initial profit target. So we got $6,000 in this stock which is 6% of our entire portfolio is in this one stock, which is not too bad. But let's say, and we can only dream, but let's say the stock goes to 12. And we had some $5 stocks many, many years ago go to 30. So this is totally plausible. And you got 1,000 shares on. Well, now that 6% of your count, that $6,000, has grown to $12,000. So now you have $12,000 in this one particular stock. So the point is, that would be a good problem to have, but the point is that at 2%, that's a big enough risk to where it's big enough to where you can still make good money on a longer term trend. It's small enough to where it's not gonna really wipe you out on a bad trade or when, not if, that trade eventually ends badly, as you know, the drawdown in the end. So let's take a look what happened. Now, truth be told, on this particular stock, it didn't trigger, and it didn't trigger, and then it didn't trigger, 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 then it didn't trigger. And I forgot about it because I'm thinking, this thing's not going to trigger. Why should I even bother? And one of you guys had a question on it or something, and all of a sudden it woke me up like, wait a minute, this thing just triggered or is getting ready to trigger and I nearly missed the trade and that's the tough part about trend following and I didn't have enough time I wanted to put a little graphic in here that I came that came out of the Facebook group which is really funny somebody drew shared a graphic where it like flatlined forever and you had the one big trade and then it flatlined forever and that's kind of like the life of a trend follower and I added a joke to it like okay you go on vacation the day before that huge winter comes in but that's the truth in this. A lot of times these outliers, they can be a little elusive. And I know over the years I've made that sound too elusive, but the reality is they can be. And you really have to work hard at this game. 90% of the time, there's nothing to do. Maybe even 95% of the time, once you place your orders and everything, you go about your life. But every now and then, that 5 to 10% is really crucial to make sure you're able to lock in a big winner like this. So that was our buy, our stop was down here, and then on the first day in, we hit that initial profit target and we trailed our stop higher. And I decided to give it a little bit of wiggle room as opposed to trailing it tighter to hopefully capture a longer term move because you almost know, when you have a 60% move in one day on a stock, you almost, with some certainty, know that it's going to correct. You just don't know if it's gonna to happen tomorrow or the next day. It might run another 20, 30% over the next few days, which would be fantastic, but it's also gonna correct pretty hard. So you gotta give it a lot of room. And so far, it hasn't done much since. It has turned into dead money. But I'm not gonna exit it because I'm gonna follow the plan. It's like I wrote in that Why I Teach article, it makes me be a better trader, which makes you be a better trader, because as I become better, you become better, and it's very cyclical. But putting out a recommendation to buy a stock, and then I have to force myself to remember to buy that stock. And then I have to force myself to practice what I preach and follow the plan. So this is a bit of a micro first thrust you got a stock, it's kind of also a head and shoulders for those of you who are into classical technical analysis. As I preach, learn tech, classical technical analysis, but don't try to trade 
it in and of itself, use it as part of the piece of the puzzle. In other words, look for a setup within something like classical technical analysis, so you have that working for you. But we got a nice little first thrust happening here. And here's our setup. We're going to short. This is 250 shares per 100,000. And we have 44.50 as the entry, 52.50. And we're going to risk eight points on that. So this is what that looks like. Sell short is here. And so far, it really hasn't worked out. I think we had one day in the plus column. But we could hope, right? I think the stock is still in a lot of trouble. Okay. Any questions on the open portfolio? I do have one more that I'm short. I think I have a long or two in there, two in the goals. But I have one more long that i'll show you in just a minute did you say hope <laughs> no we gotta have some hope you know you gotta be you gotta be positive what did stephen wright say i was gonna be a pessimist but i figured it, it wouldn't work out i've got a lot of new people now because of my weekly show over at stockcharts.com so first of all welcome you guys glad to have you here and I get a, this is one of my reoccurring questions is, can you use patterns in different time frames? And, and the answer is yes, all patterns are fractal. So on the hourly chart, if you go back to the peak of the S&P, the recent peak that is, back in September, you could see that we did have a bow tie down. So yeah, you can use bow ties or other setups on an intraday basis. Frenchie says, what day and time are you on stock charts? I'm on every Wednesday at noon Eastern. And the name of the show is Trading Simplified. And if we get a chance, we can pull that up in a minute. But if you go to stockcharts.com slash TV, you can get the show there. And yeah, I'd love to have you guys there. We had, uh, we had like a thousand people live yesterday, 900 and change. And that was exciting. <laughs> you know, right before the producer told me, yeah, we got a thousand people here today. Oh, okay. So this was a sell signal for the hourly chart. Okay. Any questions on any of that? We'll get into the live charts. I'll show you one or two other trades that I'm working right now. This is left over from last week. I've got a lot of questions on psychology. So, I would highly recommend you take the mindset course under the members area. And the reason I created this learning management system is one, obviously for personal gain, obviously I get paid if you become a member. But one of the main reasons was I realized I was ineffective in trying to teach everyone on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And then even people that I work with for years were missing quite a few pieces and they were having some psychological issues or psychi uh, psychology issues, I should say, maybe some psychological issues too, like we all do. And quite a few were asking a lot of questions on money management. I'm like, well, geez, I preach this over and over. You should know it. And then once we started this learning management system, it made me realize that, well, by looking at the course progress, if you're asking a lot of money management questions, finish the money management course first, and let's see where you are. And if there's anything that's missing, then I can turn around and make that better. In fact, the Q&A is really, we really got a fantastic archive of great material in the Q&A. And I think I'm gonna need to incorporate a lot of that into the learning manager system. Because one thing that I was thinking about lately is what new material do I want to bring in to this members area? And I think that has happened organically, if that's the right word, through the Q and A, because we've got some great, tons of questions on the opening gap reversals, questions about automated trailing stops, a lot of things about how to do opening gap reversals with hands off type of trading. And then in more recent times, we'll be getting some questions about the psychology. So pretty excited about all that, pretty excited about this members area. I know I'm a nerd. If you are a member of DaveLander.com, you have to be a member, and that's to keep the riffraff out. Half kidding. Make sure you join the Facebook group, which is at the top of the members page. Also, I get a lot of questions on 
where's this and where's that. If you go to the members area, and this has been updated since then, but if you go to the members area down here, you should be able to find pretty much anything that you need, okay? And you could also find members resources, which should be down here somewhere. And that's where you'll find the spreadsheet and some of the other goodies that I give out to the members. Scans and things like that. On things of that nature. Anybody remember the <laughs> the old uh, Otto Schwarzenegger I used to do? All right, let's get the uh, telecharts shared and up and running. And then we'll open it up. If you guys want to start asking about individual stock questions, feel free to do so. Your favorite stock picks. While we get this up and running. So let's start by looking at the, yeah, keep them coming. Good, good, good. We'll start by looking at the overall market. So today, I guess, is kind of exhibit A about the short side. It's like, there's no free lunch. It's like you feel really good when the market sell it off hard, but then you get absolutely creamed. And I just walked over to my trading system, trading system, trading screens, and then I uh, had to catch myself from dropping an F-bomb. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the piece. As I said a minute ago, we do have that bow tie down. Bow ties after all time highs, in this particular case, close enough for government work because this is a second mouse signal, as we discussed earlier. This is really close to all time highs. Technically, this signal is still in effect until and unless you take out those old highs. Not that you would stay short and be obstinate through all that. But we're getting a little bounce today. As you know, the retrace rallies can really suck on the short side. But I think it's important to short for the aforementioned reasons. Now, if you didn't know anything about markets, you could say, well, I know a little bit about the net net. And we're kind of wide and loose and sideways here. And on a net net basis, we haven't gone anywhere in a long, 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 long time, all the way to September of what? 2018. So that's over a year ago. Now, obviously, we worked our way higher since. Shorter term, we're wide and loose. Much shorter term, we're in a bit of a spill, as illustrated by the bow ties. Now, I guess over the last couple of days, we've traded higher once again. But even with today's rally, you can see, let's see where we are. We're still in a bit of a slide lower. Obviously, on your stops, just in case, as I often say, not that I want it to happen, but... I'm perfectly okay with getting stopped out of all my shorts, provided that the market follows through to the long side and I can start buying a bunch of stocks and make a bunch of money on the long side. I don't care which way the market goes. I think Gary Kaltbaum once said, give me an uptrend, give me a downtrend, or give me a ticket to Tahiti. I would much rather just sit back and relax in a longer term up bull market than fuss around with these shorts. All right, we'll get to that, Donald. Good observation. So NASDAQ up a little bit. NASDAQ looks a little bit worse than the P's, but not much, but they both look kind of dubious at best. As you can see, NASDAQ sideways like the overall market. NASDAQ double mouse or second mouse signal in here. Actually kind of a triple mouse signal. That's kind of interesting. First time I'm seeing that. The other thing, too, is what did we talk about earlier? Classical technical analysis. And in some cases, let's see if we could draw it in. Yeah, keep the picks coming. I'll get done in just a minute. I promise, I promise, I promise. So we had a peak here, and then we had a peak here, and then we had another peak here. So that looks a little bit like a head and shoulders to me. Not perfect, but sort of. And I do like the fact that this right shoulder is a little bit higher than the left. I'm not sure where I learned that, if it's through observations or what. But I think that this, when your right shoulder is higher, I think it kind of fakes people out a little bit, making them thinking that, making them think that it's going to go back to brand new highs. So from that aspect, it does look like a big potential top is in place. As I often say, indicators are great, but use them sparingly, and they're more illustrators to show you what might be going on. So I really didn't look at this head and shoulders too much until I just pulled the chart up and saw bow tie, bow tie, bow tie, three bow ties. Well, what's, what else 
happens in threes. So, well, triple tops and possible head and shoulder tops. So NASDAQ looking a little bit ugly in here. As I said earlier, though, if you look at the longer term signals or longer term chart and something like the piece, longer term, and let's see if I could hit the right key. Okay, longer term, there's your moving averages. You can see we're back above the 50 today. The 200 is still headed higher. Okay, so that suggests maybe the longer term trend is still intact. Will we get a death cross if this 50 continues lower? It might because you're going to be adding in some lower prices here on the 50. And then you're going to be adding in some higher prices on the 200. So that could make an interesting situation where this 50 could cross that 200. Not the end of the world on a death, death cross. It's not what happens between death cross and golden cross, meaning the 50 going below the 200 as a death cross and crossing back above the 200 as a golden cross. It's what happens in between. It's the magnitude of the move. If you go back several years when we had a death cross and everybody was going nuts, the media loves a death cross. Death cross, death cross. <laughs> But everybody was going kind of crazy. And I went in and said, well, the signal in and of itself has a small edge. Rob Hanna has done a lot of testing there. The number 4% comes to mind. It's not big enough to even bother with. However, the magnitude of what happens in between is pretty amazing, or it can be pretty amazing. You can have some pretty serious slides after a death cross to the bottom to the downside now that goes for any signal in the world you go in and look at some of the the, the tfm type of stuff trend following more on stuff such as just that the tfm 10 percent system and you have some incredibly huge diaper change moments boring a line from ian mcactivity the late and great Ian McActivy, who I try to channel every time I do a presentation because he gave the best presentation in the world and was funny as hell. But anyway, he called it diaper change moments. Well, if you go back and look at the S&P 500, you take a look at that death cross in 2008. You know, people are like, I didn't see 2008 coming. Oh, I, I lost half my money. It's like, well, it's a horrible situation not to make light of the situation because believe me it was horrible and i felt horrible for people but you had a death cross before that happened you had a bow tie down you had a weekly bow tie down you had signals coming out the wazoo so just for s and g's let's just see what that death cross what's the diaper change on that 53 percent let's just say 54 percent round numbers from that death cross now sometimes it doesn't sell off that hard like this one right here but Sometimes it's good to get out the way, especially if you're at all-time highs in a market. Even this little slide back here, which I think every one of us got out of the market on. We got stopped out because we used stops on longs. And I can't imagine. It would have to be one good-looking long to survive that. But look at this death cross here. That's a pretty big drop after the death cross. And let's just, for S&Gs, take a look at that real quick. And then I promise I'll get to all those stock picks. we got plenty of time today. So let's see. The death cross was 2763. Death cross was there on 12.7. So let's take a measurement from 12.7 down to the low. This is on a closing basis. That's 11% drop. Well, amazingly, that's the exact diaper change that the TFM 10% 10 system had too. So by accident, I'm kind of backing into something here by mount, by plotting the 50 and 200 to talk about death crosses, which I did not intend to do today, but here we are. But I kind of backed into something. If you have a signal, take it seriously because you don't know whether or not it's going to be the big one, Elizabeth implied. I've written a lot about that. And then I noticed in Greg Morris's book, Investing with the Trend, and in some of his blogs on stockcharts.com, back when he was running $5 billion or so, he 
his mantra was, we treat all signals as if it will become the big one. And I think you have to treat that. So it doesn't have to be my cell signal. It doesn't have to be a tacros or anything else that's well publicized. It could be whatever you're doing. It could just be the net net price move. Say, oh, if it drops 10%, maybe I need to think about getting out the way because how do I know it's not going to drop another 30, 40, or 50%? And believe me, it happens. NASDAQ, 1999, 73% or 80% loss. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, it's, I was drinking my own Kool-Aid for a while in the late 90s because I was printing so much money. And I got humbled pretty quick. Don't worry about that. Anyway, I if you'd asked me when the NASDAQ was whatever it was, 5,015 or 5150 or whatever it was back then, I forget the exact high. It was the day my daughter was born, which was ironic. But anyway, and... You told me that it was going to be 80% lower about a year from now. I'd, I'd have looked at you like you pooed your pants. But it was. So markets go up and markets go down. If you don't walk away with anything today, <laughs> trust me on that. All right. Let's take a look at the Rusty <gasps> Death Cross. I didn't know that. We have a Death Cross in the Rusty. Look at that. Actually, we've had a big one back here. Oh, that's just for SG since we're stuck on this stupid Death Cross. It's only stupid because the media makes a big old deal about it. So it looks like that day there, round numbers. And let's see what that drop was. Yeah, look at that. 15% drop. 15% drop. Nearly 16% drop from the death cross. That's a pretty substantial drop. Over what? A month and a half? Now, you mean to tell me you should ride out that type of sell off like i said back in january when i moved to my rental house i'm now in the new house in the new office but when i made my first move when i went to pick up the u-haul truck the guy I was watching cnbc and he's like man i'm glad i held on i wish i'd have bought i wish i'd have bought in at the low I wish i'd have bought more it's like well okay that'll work until it don't all right let me just go through this sectors real quick Market wide and loose at best, little toppy. That's the whole point. The energies tried to get going, and I got pretty excited about the energies, and I tried to get long some, but luckily, waiting for entries kept me out of trouble there. Metals and mining overall still looking kind of ugly in here, although today they're getting a little bit of a bounce, as you can see. Let's take a look at gold and silver. I've been talking a lot about gold and silver lately. I've been bullish on them. Remember the AUI setup we talked about a little while ago? Well, it really hasn't materialized just yet, and this is what gold overall is doing, so that shouldn't be a shocker. I think right here is an inflection point. If we take out this low here, I would be concerned. If we take out this little pivot high here, then it could be off to the races to make new highs, and I'm just going to sit tight, and here comes that word, hope that the market takes off soon silver same sort of action silver looks a little bit more toppy than gold but as long as it holds that recent low i'm not going to get too excited now as you go through these sectors you can see most of them look like they are in trouble one thing i find kind of interesting is take a look at the foods now foods are a defensive area people still eat in a bull market right i'm sorry a bear market so food can be a defensive area where it could be a bit of a flight to safety. And that's a flight to safety or relative strength trading in a bear market or a down market is a bad idea. It's like running to the bow of the Titanic. Yeah, you'll be the last to sink, but you're still going to sink. Anyway, bow tie down in foods, I find that kind of interesting because it seems like foods will kind of hang in there given the nature of the overall market. Now, not that you want to rush out and short the banks, but as you can see, kind of wide and loose in here, still toppy at best. Insurance and other financials looking a little dubious. You can see this is a little bit cleaner head and shoulder top. Real estate's hanging in there, but it's hard for me to get excited about the REITs. And the reason they're hanging in there is because bonds have not gone down as of late. Drugs in here, choppy, 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 wide and loose, but for the most part have been generally working their way lower as of late. 
I am bearish on health services. A minute ago, I said I was going to show you some other stocks that I'm trading. NVCR was a recommendation, not an recomm official recommendation, but an honorable mention in the trading service a while back. And as you can see, so far from that little first thrust down, it's worked out okay. I'm not to my initial profit target on that, but I am trying to buy this market lower to take those partial profits. And that's in healthcare. Defense is hanging in there, but beginning to lose some momentum. Again, if you didn't know anything about the markets, but you understood the net net price change, where's the price today? Where's the price a few months ago? You can see it's only about a percent higher in a couple of months. So it's certainly lost some of that upside momentum. Manufacturing looks like it's kind of rolling over. And as you go through these, you can see retail broke out, came back in, now trying to rally again. In most of these areas, at least from where I sit, still look pretty dubious or at the least wide and loose. There's transports. Let's take a look at computer software. I was a little bearish on those guys. You can see it looks like I have a head and shoulders drawn in here. So until we take out that little, those little peaks, I wouldn't get too excited about software. Semiconductors wide and loose and all over the place, although not too far from all time highs. Utilities continue to work their way higher, and that's probably because bonds, for the most part, have been hanging in there. Although now that I'm looking at it, it kind of has a bit of a gatekeeper kind of look to it, meaning that it had a sharp retrace higher, and now it's beginning to sell off from that retrace. So bonds could be topping out in here. I'm just kind of noticing this today as we look at it. I wouldn't rush out and short them, but they certainly look like they could be in trouble. And just for S&Gs, let's take a look at the dollar. The dollar, for the most part, hanging in there. That might be what's mucking up my gold positions so far. I do have a gold penny stock. Speaking of other stocks that I'm trading, is it AUI? No, it's AKG. I'm long this one from this little pullback back here. Not that I would recommend you rush out and buy penny stocks, but I thought it was worth a shot for an S&G type of trade. All right, let's go ahead and shift gears and get into individual issues. Okay, Donald wants to know about DHT. Okay, it is looking okay in here. I, you know, I need to flesh things out a little bit more probably for the newer guys and girls since we have quite a few of you guys and I'm, I'm very humbled by that but in the facebook group i said oh i hate educational stocks and my wife kind of keeps a loose eye on what's going on there and she said well why do you hate them and i'm like well everybody knows that you know it's like she says what if i'm a new person coming in i'm like oh okay good point i a lot of times i preach to the choir here knowing that everybody is up to speed i did a lot of mechanical testing a while back and uh, a long, long time ago, I did a lot, a lot of mechanical testing, but every now and then I'll dust off the computer and, and just program some stuff in and do some testing. I haven't done it in a while, but a few years back, I did some testing and I could, I could make a lot of this simplified trend following work in a lot of different markets, but I couldn't really make it work in the shippers and I couldn't really make it work in the educational stocks. And every time I trade a shipper or educational stock, especially an educational stock, and lose money, uh, that little computer testing voice inside the back of my head kind of haunts me. Well, Dave, you know you can't make money on those stocks because they don't trend. Every now and then, I think they can trend. But even if you look at this chart, which has lasted higher nicely, longer term, it does look like electrocardiogram. So what do I think about it? I think it looks interesting. I think if it pulled back a little bit further, it might be worth a shot. My only problem is a lot of these shippers and a lot of these stocks at low levels like this have a lot of overhead supply to deal with. Even though that's a long, long time ago, I think I would pass on that one. I mean, it could turn into a swing trade, but I think it would pass. All right, Donald's bullish on his shippers. Fro, I think, is another shipper. Or is that an airline? That's a shipper. That looks kind of interesting. Let's see if we got any bad memories. Eh, you got some bad memories, but they're a little higher than where we were, and they're pretty long ways away. Let's take a look at the weekly chart. Yeah, you do have some 
a lot to get through, but this is a little bit better looking stock than the other one. On a pullback, maybe, okay? A little bit deeper pullback, but good eye on that, Donald, for sure. Donald says, some of these shippers are doing really well lately. Yeah, you know what? Let's look at all of them. <laughs> Take a look at the... Let's sort them by, let's say, 30-day volume. And let's see what we got. Yeah, there's Nat. Kind of taking off in here. Now, see, that looks kind of interesting. Let's see what happens on a pullback on that one. You know, the problem is they just kind of take off. They kind of blast higher without any warning, you know. But, yeah, on a pullback, that might be interested. T and K is another one. It's kind of blasted higher as of late. And eh, you got some overhead supply, but it's a long, long ways in the past. There's your DHT. This one doesn't look so hot. And it's trying to rally, but it has a mount of overhead supply. Now, Fro, we talked about already. ST and G is working its way higher. That one's wide and loose, wide and loose, downtrend. Too many days in the pullback, wide and loose. Let's see if we can find something interesting in here. Maybe on a pullback, that was the LPG. Glog, wide and loose. SB, wide and loose. See how they mostly wide and loose? See how they take off and then implode? <laughs> it could be kind of frustrating. Salt, wide and loose. CMRE. Eagle. Let's just go through a few more, get to the thinner issues, see if there's anything there. See, that would catch my eye. Let's see what's going on longer term. Let's take a look at the weekly chart. Oh, look at that. So that's kind of interesting. That's kind of in new territory. Uh, wide and loose longer term, but at least it's in new territory. Maybe on a pullback. INSW, put that on your watch list. And I think we're pretty much done with the shippers. Let's see what that is. That's kind of thin. I don't like that gap down. Yeah, I wouldn't take it due to that gap down. All right, I think that's enough of that. DSSI. Any other stock picks you guys want to take a look at? Yeah, that's another shipper. Yeah, this is a newer issue, so this might be worth watching. I'd prefer a trend to be more than just a few huge bars on a breakout. I'd almost prefer if we had like 10 mediocre bars and then two or three big bars like this in a longer term trend, maybe on a pullback. We'll, I'll know it like just a, Justice Potter Stewart. I'll know it when I see it. All right, any more? Got a quiet bunch today. Don't be afraid to speak up. I won't beat you up too bad. Some guy, week after week after week, you hate all my stock picks. It's like, well, pick better stocks. <laughs> what was the, uh... remember Liar Liar? Joey's on the phone. He knocked over another ATM. He wants to know what to do. Stop breaking the law. <laughs> pick better stocks. Now, if you're newer to trading, I promise not to beat you up too much. Just try to find something that's in a trend because I am a trend follower. All right, I think we're closing in on the end here. Going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate taking taking time out of your busy schedule. Any unanswered questions, you can shoot me an email at davidavelandry.com. If you are a member of davelandry.com, then submit them through the management system, learning management system, so that I can get to those and put together a presentation. We don't talk to you now and then. Everybody have a great weekend, and hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls next week. Thank you so much.